My name's Nick Kafka, and I'll be moderating the session. I uh, am the CEO and founder of Teach a Man to Fish, which is a nonprofit trying to help schools in developing countries teach on to enterprise education to schools by getting them to set up businesses. So this is a, if you haven't been to one already, this is an exciting format because we have here uh, three, well, two current ministers of education, one former minister of education, uh, and a uh, couple of very uh, esteemed uh, social entrepreneurs and education leaders to pitch their policy ideas for what, in an ideal world, they would like to see happening in the world of education. So this is a chance not only to unpack their ideas and to uh, have a think about that yourself, but also to get an insight into the minds and the workings of ministers of education. So uh, I'd encourage the ministers to uh, not just uh, you know, agree nicely with whatever said, but to, uh, to challenge uh, what's put before you in the same way that you would if when you're in your ministry or when you were a minister, um, someone was coming to you with an idea to, to be implemented. You know, what, what are the, uh, the drawbacks? They, they might all sound lovely in practice, but, you know, will it be affordable? Who, which groups will it negatively interest? So, um, yeah, let me introduce, first of all, uh, our honorable ministers. So we have uh, George Werner, the uh, Minister for Education in Liberia, and Paul Rabery, the uh, Minister for Education in uh, Madagascar, and uh, Maya Sadu, the uh, former Minister for Education uh, in Moldova. And uh, the first of our speakers today possibly needs no introduction. It's Wendy Kopp, who is the CEO and founder of Teach for All, uh, a second career after uh, <laughs> creating the incredibly successful Teach for America. So uh, without further ado, uh, Wendy, please come and uh, share 10 to 15 minutes on your ideas. Thank you. Um, well, I am so excited to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm excited to present an idea that has been, thank you, um, brewing for me and for many of us across Teach for All for some time now. Um, and it's a proposal um, that I believe would, first of all, bring communities together um, with a lot more energy for ensuring that all children fulfill their potential. Um, it would orient us towards the broad outcomes that we know are so critical for kids growing up today. Um, and I believe it would ultimately radically improve our collective welfare. Um, so the proposal is, oops, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the proposal is that in any given local community, so communities all over the world, a local leader, so it could be a mayor, um, a head of a school system, a community member who's very respected, would convene the stakeholders in a community, meaning students, parents, educators, um, policymakers, other, you know, just the wide range of folks in a community in an effort to develop a shared vision for children. So that vision would be locally rooted in the sense of reflective of the local context, culture, values, aspirations, a deep understanding of the actual challenges facing kids the actual um, pathways to opportunity in a local community. And at the same time, it would need to be reflective of uh, our global learnings and global understandings about what the world requires. So the visions would look maybe something like this. Um, this is a vision that um, the partner in Haiti of, of Teach for All developed before they started. Um, they work in four rural communities in Haiti, and before they set out, on their effort to launch Anse Poiti, which is, is Creole for Teach for Haiti, they engaged all of the stakeholders in these rural communities um, around the challenge of developing a vision for what they wanted to be true for their children when they were 25 years old. So they asked questions like, you know, what is our vision for our communities? Like, what do we want for our communities? What do we want for, for Haiti? What are the challenges facing kids in getting there? You know, when we consider the students who've grown up who have experienced success, what's true for them? Um, and Nadine Paul, who, who was the founder of, of Anse Poiti, who orchestrated this whole process, also brought her own understandings um, and values into the mix. Um, and so she worked with communities to co-create 
um, this vision for, for kids. I don't know if you can read it, but the main ideas are that the kids will be able to provide for themselves and their families, ensure their kids attain an excellent education, that they'll be equipped to be active citizens in Haiti, that they'll be respected leaders in communities um, who, who will help shape a, a stronger Haiti. Uh, so the idea and the proposal is that in every community, again, people would come together to create these shared visions, but of course that wouldn't be the end. The, the local leader would then continue to convene uh, the local stakeholders around the question of how are we doing in relation to this vision? What needs to happen? What needs to change? What are we learning as we, as we do make progress? What's going wrong? And, and basically what more do we need to be doing individually and collectively in order to, to reach the vision. Okay, so that's the big idea, the proposal. And there are three big reasons that I personally um, am so compelled by, by this idea. So the first of them is that success in this work of ours, the, the endeavor to ensure that all children um, have the opportunities they deserve, so equity and excellence for kids, Success will require bringing communities together in a collective effort for change. Um, as I've progressed in this work, I've become more and more convinced that, that actually the community is the unit of change. I think in education we often make assumptions about, different assumptions about what the, the unit of change is. Many people think the classroom is the unit of change, others think the school is the unit of change. Um, but as we think about the challenges we face in ensuring equity and excellence for kids, it's clear that those challenges don't begin in classrooms and they don't begin in schools. So any effort to address the problem in its full complexity, and I think we have to address the problem in its full complexity in order to, to make a meaningful and, and sustainable change, has to happen at the level of the community. So the implication is that um, Certainly teachers are, are crucial and school leaders are crucial, but that our effort needs to go beyond ensuring strong teachers and, and strong school leaders and needs to look at how do we develop collective leadership at the community level? How do we ensure that we have strong leadership at every level of the system, at every level of policy, and across sectors in communities, all oriented towards um, uh, ensuring opportunity for, for all children. So that's, that's reason number one. Um, now, if you buy the idea that developing collective leadership at the community level is crucial if we're going to make sustainable progress, then the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we develop collective leadership? Now, um, I'm here with a network of folks at Teach for All who, who share a purpose, which is to help develop collective leadership to ensure that all children fulfill their potential. And we've been on a very long learning journey in, in trying to understand how do we do that. Our particular work is to work to galvanize the rising generation of kind of future leaders, channel their energy into communities. You know, they commit initially two years to teach, we invest a lot in them, but the idea is to cultivate their long-term commitment um, to change and to, to develop them as leaders who will inspire leadership in others, in their students, in the other teachers in their schools, and the other folks in their communities. So this question of how do we actually do this? Like where we see evidence of true collective leadership moving the needle for kids at the school, at the community level, what is going on has actually, I mean our best guess is that, you know, the, the number one solution in, in, this, in this endeavor is to put at the center of our work in any given community an effort to develop a shared vision amongst the stakeholders, to build people's relationships, and to create essentially space for those folks to come together, to step back from their individual pursuits, um, and think together about what they can do what more they can do individually, certainly, but also what they can do collectively um, to move ahead. I think it's really encouraging that the literature on system change would, would back this up almost to, to a letter. Um, I don't know if you all have seen the, the article called The Dawn of System Leadership by Peter Senge and, and his colleagues, but I would highly recommend it. I'm kind of obsessed with it. He, 
of course, has worked on system change efforts across multiple sectors and basically concludes that the trick in affecting system change is developing collective leadership and that the path to developing collective leadership is um, to create a shared vision, create space for building relationships, and create what he calls reflective space, um, just the space for people to step back and think together. And I'm going to read just one very short passage from this article that I think will help bring to life why this is so powerful. Um, he wrote, leaders must create the space where people living with the problem can come together to tell the truth, think more deeply about what is really happening, explore the options beyond popular thinking, and search for higher leverage changes through progressive cycles of action and reflection and learning over time. This seems to be crucial not only in initiating collaborative efforts, but in what ultimately can arise from them. Um, so that's the second reason. And the third is that I think this is our best bet um, for reorienting um, our collective work towards the broader outcomes that will actually enable our kids to shape a better future for themselves and all of us. Um, I think this is probably a group of people that some time ago, no doubt, embraced the idea that we need to be oriented towards you know, supporting our kids to do more than learn narrow academic outcomes, which are crucial, but, but not sufficient. Um, the kids growing up today are facing an unbelievable set of challenges, a turbulent economy. I just saw a study by McKinsey that said that half of the jobs, half of the activities that go on today in the working world could be automated and eliminated by existing already proven technology. Um, and at the same time, beyond the kind of turbulent economy, we face so many increasingly complex and interconnected challenges with the climate and conflict and um, you know, rising tides of prejudice and nationalism, et cetera. Um, so it's so clear that if, we're, if we have any hope for a more peaceful and sustainable um, and kind of thriving future, it's for our kids to, to grow um, as leaders who are, have the competencies, the values, um, the dispositions necessary to be able to navigate a turbulent economy and, and solve these pressing problems. And yet, we're stuck. And, and, you know, you probably can't even walk the halls in this place without people reflecting on how, despite our kind of knowing what I just said intellectually, we're, we're still stuck in, in these systems that are oriented much more narrowly. And I think it's kind of clear why when you stop and think about it. Today's systems were created by a group of people in a very different environment who had a different vision for what their kids needed to be able to do by age 25. Um, so it just seems clear that it's very imperative that we step back from our current constraints and constructs to think together about, you know, given where we are today and given where the world and our communities are headed and where we want them to go, you know, what is the vision that we need to be working towards? And then, and then we're going to need to work together to recreate everything in order to orient towards that. So all to say, um, you know, if we want to ensure that the children in our classrooms today are you know, growing as the leaders who can shape a better future for themselves and for all of us. We need to start by recognizing that the community is really the unit of change, that collective leadership is our best strategy for affecting the change that we need to see in communities, and that the shared vision and relationships and reflective space are the, the most important tools um, we're going to need to use in order to create the collective leadership that we need to see. So thank you for listening, and I really look forward to engaging in the discussion. Wonderful. Big round of applause. Thank you. Wow. So, so what a vision. But uh, you know, is this something you could implement in your country? You know, what are the questions that you would have for Wendy about the practicalities of implementing this. Um, George, could we start with you? Uh, you got a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh
compare it. Uh, I found it. Um, during the outbreak of Ebola in Liberia, we found out that the only way we could defeat Ebola, and this came after many deaths and lessons learned, was through the model you espoused, community engagement. And so I see where that is applicable for the education system. My question is, would you begin at the family level before getting to the community level? I guess I can, oh, yeah. Um, I think the families need to be deeply involved. In fact, you know, when, when we think about how to build these kind of collective, contextualized visions, we start with students, their parents, like we start with families. Um, but I think, again, I guess I go back to what the unit of change is, and I think probably there are lots of units of change, but I think to tackle the issues in their complexity, we do need to look at a community level. And I think it's such a powerful idea to have a, a leader in a community who can surface divergent perspectives from families, because some families will have different expectations for their kids than others, from the most respected elders in the community, from the newest, most visionary young people in the community, to put all those perspectives in a pot. Um, which I think leads us to ultimately a higher order definition um, that's, that's rooted in a broader set of kind of possibilities and expectations. Wonderful. Uh, Maya, hopefully your microphone would work. What, what would your questions to, uh, to Wendy be? Well, while I was uh, still at the ministry, we did uh, try to have a kind of a board, the community board for the school, which would include uh, the mayor, representatives of local organizations, civil society organizations, if there were any parents and anybody who was interested to participate in this board. So we made it compulsory for all the schools, but it didn't work. It worked only... So it became a formality. It didn't really uh, involve in the life of the school. Um, it worked only for some schools, a pretty limited number, that got uh, specific support. Mm -hmm. And so you had a project which went there, worked with people, with parents, with kids, with teachers. So this was a substantial support that some of the schools got. But this mm -hmm. was a limited number of schools that, that could get this support. Mm -hmm. So for the rest of the country, it's just on paper, but it doesn't help mm. in the reality. So my question is, what would be the role of the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. of the education authorities, for yeah. this to work? Because uh, you might have leaders in small communities which want to take this uh, on and want to, yeah. to do this, and where you might not have. Do you expect the school principals to become um, these yeah. uh, leaders, or this would be a conflict of interest because you know, yeah. the school principal see things from his perspective or her perspective yeah. and not necessarily uh, would allow for the community to participate. Yeah. Um, I think the ministry could play a really <coughs> crucial role in this. I think the roles, the most important roles would be, one, to identify the community leaders who you really want to lead it. I, th I think that question, is like who leads each process in the local community is, of course, incredibly critical like it, this will live or die based on you know the qualities of that person so finding out who is it in the local community who has the respect um, the responsibility etc to be able to do a good job at this so that's step one and then I think maybe the role of the ministry is to help those local leaders learn from each other and to amplify the examples like some will go better than others right some of these Visions will be exactly what you might want and others not, but helping amplify those beautiful examples of exactly what you want and help so that you can help influence and um, support the other communities to do better and better in, in, their, own, in their own endeavors. Wonderful. Uh, and Paul, if you have a question, I think uh, we'll getting it translated directly. Oui, merci. C'est pas tellement une question. Hein. 
c'est euh, un témoignage. Ce n'est pas tellement une question, c'est un témoignage. Et je pense que vous avez complètement raison dans ce sens, parce que pour le cas de Madagascar, la communauté, c'est la communauté qui s'implique en premier lieu pour l'éducation. Et euh, parce que sur les 120 000 enseignants actuellement à Madagascar, 70% sont payés par la communauté à raison de 10 dollars par mois. Et donc, grâce à la volonté de la communauté, on peut euh, travailler. Et c'est la communauté qui est, qui est donc le, le colonne vertébrale du système éducatif à Madagascar. Communauté débat, je, je veux dire. Ensuite, en ce qui concerne les infrastructures, à peu près, nous avons un besoin annuel de 3 000 euh, salles de classe par an et l'État ne subvient que de qu'à hauteur de 200 salles de classe par an et la communauté peut arriver jusqu'à 600 salles de classe par an. Je veux dire par là que euh, le rôle de la communauté et le leadership de la communauté locale est très important. Euh, Okay, so uh, the question is uh, in Madagascar. C'est pas une question, c'est un témoignage. Okay. C'est pour 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 abonder dans le sens de Madame. Okay, c'est un commentaire vous voulez dire. Non, c'est pour soutenir. Pour soutenir. Okay. Well, it's not a question. It's just some evidence to support what you just presented. In Madagascar, we had an objective of reaching 3,000 classes per year, and we reached so far 600 classes per year. And we came up with the conclusion that the leadership of the community, local community, is very important, and it helps us a lot in this regard. Oui, 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 à peu près. OK. Uh, one one uh, final uh, question from the... Uh. Uh, you, you, you set my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you maybe a philosophical question. What to you does the community um, of the future look like for the school? What would be the characteristics for your engaged community influencing improved learning outcomes for children? Are you asking what, what my vision for school would be? Is that what you're asking or no? That plus the role of the community yeah. you described. Yeah. Um, so. I feel like I don't need to figure out, and, and in fact, I'm not even going to try what the school of the future looks like because I believe so strongly that the only key, I mean, if I've learned one thing in the last, actually, 28 years in this journey, it's that the only path to significant, sustainable change is locally rooted leadership. Like, they, people who deeply understand the local context and can operate with trust in the community need to own the process. And, and so what I think is so important is that they actually develop the vision in a way that is globally informed. Like, we need to have an infrastructure we don't have in virtually any country and certainly not in the global community to help local leaders actually learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, I know it's a cheap way out of the question, but I feel like the most important thing is actually the process because strong leadership is so crucial to ultimately effective implementation. I do think that the community, you know, maybe will change the notion of what happens in schools and what happens outside of schools. And um, I think this process is the way to bring you know, in the developed world, people together across ideological lines because, you know, once, that's the, this is the unifying question. What do we want for our children? That's the one question that can actually bring us together. And then we'll realize that all the things we fight about have nothing to do with whether or not we're going to get there. Like, that's a whole different endeavor than we're all battling to, to over at the moment. And in the, in the 
more developing world where I hope those same ideological debates don't exist. It's also the way to get such strong community engagement and, and, and buy-in, which I think is also so crucial. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, a, a round of applause for uh, Wendy. So now I think is the exciting bit, whether we decide whether uh, Wendy's policy actually gets put into practice or not. So both the judges and the audience can now vote with a show of hands, and we'll, we'll see uh, which, how many out of our three judges and how many from the audience thinks this is a winning policy that can be implemented. So uh, if you want uh, the policy, stick your hands up now. So I think we have uh, two out of three education ministers oh. and, and a majority of the audience. So uh, Wendy, your policy will become national policy and in Liberia as well. No, 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 no. You, 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 get to, you get to have both if you like them both. <laughs> and the second one is going to be very good too. So next up we have uh, Scott Weber, who is the Director General of Interpeace, uh, an, a, an accomplished uh, humanitarian, and he will tell you all about an exciting idea for the Young Leaders of Tomorrow, uh, developing leadership facilitation and peace building skills for global citizens. Super. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Wendy, also. I enjoyed that tremendously. There's a lot that you're going to see that echoes what Wendy was talking about. And the very bizarre thing is that both Wendy and I were in Colombia right before coming here together. We're probably on the same plane. Um, look, ministers, um, excellencies, friends, we've been going through a global financial crisis for nearly 10 years now. But I would argue that more than a financial crisis, what we're really experiencing now is a crisis of trust. Trust in our institutions, trust in our political and social systems, and trust in each other. Now, my name is Scott Weber. I'm the Director General of Interpeace, uh, which is an independent international peacebuilding organization created by the UN back in 1994. And we operate in 22 conflict zones around the world today. Um, most of the conflicts that we're dealing with have at their origin some form of political, social, or economic exclusion, and a sense of injustice that that exclusion creates. It's at the heart of most conflicts. And so if we want to build a more peaceful world, we actually have to start locally, as Wendy said, absolutely correct. But we have to work on making our societies more inclusive. And that means uh, women's inclusion, which I think is still the biggest barrier to inclusion in, in our world, but also youth. And young people, we're working with young people all around the world, uh, primarily with young people who are either the perpetrators of violence or the victims of violence. They're actually the main victims of violence, too. We're working with the most dangerous youth in the world, the Maras in Central America. The second most dangerous country in the world after Syria is El Salvador. Uh, we're working with the youth, youth uh, gangs in, in that region. We're working in West Africa. We've worked for a long time in Liberia uh, with President Sirleaf, in Nimba County and other parts of the country, uh, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Mali, in Somalia. We have a big team in Libya, uh, countries like that in Palestine. And in working with young people, both young people who are involved in gangs and violence, sometimes violent extremism, um, or young people who are struggling to survive and just go to school and live a normal life in these types of societies. What we find is common to all of those young people is not that they all want a job. I think we always think they want a job and that's their motivation is that we just want a job. Actually, what they're really looking for is dignity. They're really looking for dignity. A job can give dignity, but not necessarily. Sometimes you can get more dignity from working in a gang at the age of 15, having a, a gun, drugs, access to uh, all sorts of power and influence with a title. That can be a source of dignity for young people that's far stronger than some of the normal channels that our society is supposed to be providing. So we have to be careful at recognizing that what young people are actually looking for is a path to dignity, uh, to define themselves, social ascension, 
to be able to grow and develop in a certain direction. And what we're seeing is that our societies and our institutions, and I'm not just thinking about the Liberias of the world, but also this is equally relevant in France. I'm French. Uh, I'm also American. It's equally relevant in America right now. So this is a universal problem. And that our, our institutions are not providing the nonviolent and productive paths to dignity for young people enough. Now, young people are also critical agents to overcome the problem of mistrust that we're talking about, being at the core of where the world is today, and to being agents of inclusion. Um, and this is where I want to come to the proposal that I'd like to put to you. Uh, what I'm suggesting is needed is that we look at how to equip young people with the skills and values of peace building and leadership. Some of this echoes the things that Wendy was talking about, absolutely. These are, these are universal lessons that we've learned the hard way over the last 20 or so years. But our educational systems, as we heard this morning, provide fairly top-down, technical, content-driven curricula and don't focus enough on life skills, on peace-building skills, uh, and values. And those are the things that I'm suggesting we can maybe complement the national curricula with in, in helpful ways. Um, what young people are also looking for in many of these societies are models of leadership to follow. And as I see, we're working right now in Abidjan, in the economic capital of, of Côte d'Ivoire, um, and with the, the most violent youth in Abidjan, called the, they call themselves the microbe, the microbes, the, the germs. And these young people, they find that their teachers in, in the schools don't, don't have the, the legitimate authority that they respect. They respect the local thug much more, who can get money quickly, who has obviously 100 young people under him, so therefore there's power. Those are the sources of leadership that they respect. But we do find that there are other sources of leadership that they respect, including religious leaders. And the reason why often religious leaders garner that respect is not that they have power, but they actually do what they say. They, they walk the talk more than other types of leaders. And that, in the young person, engenders respect. Um, now, what I'm suggesting we create is something that I, I was inspired by uh, seeing my daughter go through the Duke of Edinburgh Award program. Some of you might be aware of this. As an extracurricular program of activity with certain standards, but that are locally adapted to your society. Um, and so what I'm suggesting is we create a universally recognized extracurricular program of activity that would be adapted to each country, each society, each culture, but that would be internationally recognized. Um, and that would have a series of activities, activities at four levels, activities at the individual level, things that the young person needs to do themselves to advance in the program. Two, things that they can do with their family, to engage the family in the process of those goals. Three, at the community level. As Wendy says, the community is a critical unit of change uh, in these societies. And four, at the country level as well. What can they do for their country? where the young person comes up with the activities, that they're guided with certain ideas, and that the program of learning would have certain components. One, it would have peace building skills and values. What are those in a nutshell? It's active listening, multi-stakeholder problem solving. How do you engage others with you in co-creating solutions? As Wendy was saying, that's very much at the heart of peace building. Facilitation skills understanding that leadership is not about standing in front of people and pointing your finger and lecturing them. It's about, it's about being a, a collaborative leader. Those are very at the heart of peace building skills, but also understanding your own biases and recognizing and valuing diversity. Those are peace building skills and values in a nutshell. Two, and this is crucial, is life skills. What we see with many of these young people that we work with is that they don't have any guiding, guidance on how to manage their emotions how to manage the, the stress that they feel. There's so much under stress in these societies. Um, but they, they, they we're not helping them, equipping them with the tools to know how to deal with that. Emotional regulation, uh, resilience, which is a key aspect of managing oneself. Um, 
critical thinking, to not just accept what your leaders tell you to do, but to have a critical mindset. Uh, but also, and this is crucial, is also working on the notion of masculinity and gender in, among young people, which is at the heart of a lot of the trajectories towards violence, unfortunately. So what do we need to make this happen? One is that we have to help teachers become models of the behavior, because they can teach something in a classroom, but if they don't model the behavior in their day to day, it's not going to work. Huh? You have to walk the talk. You have to be genuine. Um, so they need support. Two is we have to offer tools for the community to be able to support young people in the community who go through the program so that the community valorizes those young people. They have, they have ways of valorizing the young people to give them, to give them the dignity, again, the dignity at the local level. We need toolkits. We need the resources to develop the toolkits, to develop the mentoring uh, capacities, the quality control for this. But crucially, and for ministers of education, I think this would be important for ministers of education to valorize a program like this with certificate, certification of some sort that would help a young person who's gone through this type of program over a few years to, to be recognized more easily with their Ministry of Labor and with the private sector uh, in terms of getting a job. Because these are key skill sets that you need to be a productive citizen of your country and that uh, the private sector would valorize that in the job market. Um, I started by saying at the beginning that the world is, in my view, uh, really gripped by a crisis of trust. The, the, I just want to say a few words about trust, because I think it's a really important thing, is that trust is at the heart of building peace. I, I tell people all the time, we're working on building the state in Somalia, for example. The president of Somalia, who just stepped down, uh, used to be my director in Mogadishu for seven years. We've been working with different parts of Somalia to build the state again after 21 years of chaos. Um, that's all fine. You can build infrastructure, you can build all those things, but those things will go up in smoke if you don't also work on trust. Trust horizontally between groups in society and trust vertically between the people and their government. Trust is at the heart of building more peaceful societies. At the heart of doing that is to make solutions inclusive, participatory. Uh, now, the beauty of trust, though, is that no matter how much influence I have, and I'm sitting in front of ministers here, I can't force you to trust me. No matter how much influence I have, I can't buy your trust either. Any of you, right? You have to willingly give that to me. You have to give me your trust. I can't force you to trust me. So the, the way I can earn your trust, remember the term is to earn someone's trust, is to act in a trustworthy manner, right? If I act in a trustworthy manner, I'm more likely to earn your trust. And so if we really want to overcome this crisis of trust, we need young people and the next generations that are coming up, up, up in our societies to act in a trustworthy manner, to be able to know how to build trust by acting in a trustworthy manner. And that's these skill sets that we need to uh, equip them with at an early age so that they can be productive, peaceful members of society and help us overcome that crisis of trust. Thank you. Wonderful. A big round of applause. So, same format as before. We'll give the uh, education ministers and ex-minister uh, the opportunity to first probe this. If this was coming to you in your ministry, how would you respond to this idea? Uh, and then we'll open it up, hopefully. So, as you know, we in Liberia, we are having to confront this very idea that you just spoke about for many different reasons, post-war country, post-Ebola, um, global economic trends that don't favor youth employment and other things. How do you build trust between government and the governed, particularly young people? So, uh, I take your advice personally, but I have a suggestion for the facilitator. Perhaps next year we can call the forum Global Education Skills and Values Forum. That way we can talk about more how values are inculcated yep. in communities and in schools. 
fantastic. Would you like to respond? Sure. How do you build trust, right? Um, and particularly with regard to young people. Huh? I would say we, we, we work a lot, all of us, on youth, but we don't work enough with youth. And I think that's a really important notion because when you start to engage young people, not as the problem, but as stakeholders in their situation and in a solution, what's, it, it makes them much more uh, responsive, much more constructive. They bring great ideas that from the top at the level of a minister or a, or a cabinet, you, you can't understand necessarily what they're living through every day and their incentives and disincentives in their lives. So I would say the key thing uh, in terms of having better policies to engage young people is really to actually sit down and listen and talk to them very, not as equals, but you, you know, engage with them and go to where they are. Because they're not going to come to a policy circle like this, get up in front of a big audience and give us no. You have to go to them. So we're often going to, you know, the the the, the, the local pizzeria or the uh, in a to where they gather uh, in Abidjan. They have these little gathering posts where young people get together in the in the city. That's where you have to go if you want to talk to them. But you engage them as part of the process. You know. We were involved in a, in a truce between the youth gangs of, of uh, Latin America, uh, of Central America, uh, the, the Maras that I talked about, in El Salvador in particular. Now, there are 120,000 members of these gangs in these three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, hyper-violent gangs. And in El Salvador, that's where it, where it really originated, uh, there was a truce that brought the murders down 60% in the country. And I went, at the height of the truce, I went to see one of the heads of the two gangs in the prison in the Cojulte Peque prison, the most dangerous prison in El Salvador, and asked him, okay, why are you sticking with us? You know, do you want to dismantle the gang? Are you? And he said to me, uh, hell no. We're not going to dismantle the gang. If anything, we're going to make it into a nonviolent network. But uh, if we exist, it's because society has failed. Now, the truce, which worked for two years, why did it work? There were five previous attempts. Why did it work the, the time that we, we were involved? So it's simply because we engaged them to be part of the solution. Instead of seeing them as the problem that had to be solved, we went to them and said, okay, how do we solve this? And they were part of the process. So work with youth, not on youth, is really key. Um, and your second question? No, I think... Oh, uh, it was a suggestion on values? We, we will relay that to, uh, to yeah. the, the Valky Foundation and, and see... But, if, but, but uh, if, I, if I can just say a word on the values thing, yeah, is that in, when we started in Mali, uh, our Malian team conducted a national dialogue process in Mali to understand, well, why are the Malians, in their own view, why are they back in this crisis again, after years of having been an example of democracy in West Africa? The number one issue that the Malians said, and it was different from how the outside world analyzed the, the crisis, number one issue, they said, was the breakdown of values in society in Mali. And you know, no one outside of Mali would have come up with that issue, but I think you're absolutely right. The values is at the core of much of what we need to focus on to help these countries get, get onto a healthier path. Great. Uh, I think there's, you know, probably an argument that values is such an integral part of education that you don't even have to strip it out, but let's see. Uh, Maya, wh what would you uh, challenge uh, Scott about? Well, you said that you would advise this to become an extra curricular while we most of us or many of us share the idea that in general the curriculum needs to be changed to include critical thinking, uh, life skills, and so on. So why would you uh, promote the idea of having an extra curri curricula and not have it in the main curriculum? Okay. Um, primarily because, and it's great if it echoes what's happening in the classroom, but this type of extracurricular program would be experiential learning. So it would be Activities in the community, it would be, which norm are not often part of the national curricula in, uh, in the classroom teaching. It's about things you would do outside of the classroom that you would, you would uh, carry out in other fora, other sectors. Uh, but it's really about experience. As we heard this morning, if you don't do it yourself, in a sense, it doesn't, doesn't go in. So it would complement, and hopefully national curricula will hit all these same learning objectives as well. They don't currently, in most countries I know, they do not, enough at least. But, and it's great if it does echo them, but it'll only go in even more if it becomes an, an experiential process for these young people to go through. 
Wonderfully. Uh, and finally, Paul, if you have a question, and uh, maybe Scott, you can even do a, a quick retranslation of it yourself. Oui, yeah. uh, là, là encore une fois, je, je porte un témoignage par rapport à ce qui se passe à Madagascar, parce que, comme vous savez, à Madagascar, so, presque 70% des, de la population a moins de 30 ans. Donc, pour Madagascar, la jeunesse est, est une force. Euh, même s'ils traversent des, des périodes difficiles, par exemple des périodes d'interrogation, des périodes d'incertitude, de, de, euh, de comment ils vont trouver des emplois, de, des, beaucoup de périodes difficiles qu'ils traversent, l'État, euh, la communauté malgache, et surtout l'État n'a pas la possibilité et, ni de les mettre dans, les, dans des euh, moules ni de les encadrer, on n'a qu'une seule possibilité, c'est de leur laisser la parole et euh, de les encadrer pour qu'ils puissent euh, trouver eux-mêmes leur voie. Parce que euh, Madagascar est, pas, est un état fragile, et donc les structures de l'État ne permettent pas un, un fort encadrement des jeunes. Ce qui constitue, je pense, dans une certaine mesure, une force, parce que euh, les jeunes malgaches sont dynamiques, innovent, et maîtrise la technologie, contrairement euh, à la génération précédente. Et euh, c'est pour cette raison que Madagascar, même si la, euh, Madagascar a connu beaucoup de crises, on n'est euh, jamais venu à des, des troubles euh, inextricables où il y a eu des violences euh, euh, comme ce qui se passe dans des pays euh, pauvres, euh, je dirais, similaires à Madagascar. Donc, je pense que la jeunesse il faut leur faire confiance. La jeunesse est une force pour Madagascar et la jeunesse constitue l'avenir. Donc je souscris complètement à tout ce que vous avez dit tout à l'heure. Merci beaucoup, M. le ministre. Je vais le mot So the minister was um, giving a, a commentary from Madagascar about how the, um, they, they have a, a 70% uh, of the population are young people um, and that the state is, is weak in, in uh, in Madagascar, they don't have the capacity to provide a frame for young people's development, um, which requires them to be much more entrepreneurial and self-reliant. And what he's saying is that, paradoxically, it's a weak state, but that's actually a strength, because it's, they can't provide that support, so young people are, have to be more entrepreneurial, creative, and this generation, he's saying, is, is much more connected, is much more capable of of doing uh, things beyond their geographic locality, and, and so it's a, it's a strength uh, for them, and so that's why he totally subscribes to the idea of, um, uh, of really empowering young people to be uh, driving their own development, uh, not just relying on the state to provide uh, for them. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, we're getting closer to the end, but maybe we can finally open up to the audience. The, there's a, a question at the back. Um, thank you so much for your interesting proposal. And I actually have a follow-up question and then maybe um, another uh, particularly for Jordan, um, where I come from. So um, how would you suggest implementing building trust throughout the four levels you mentioned? So you, there's the individual level and then the with family and then locally or and then nationally. So how would you suggest through your proposal, how would you build trust throughout these four levels? And my second question is, Um, in Jordan, we do have host communities where you can find Syrian refugees um, going through different shifts of educational sessions with Jordanian students. And it's interesting to see that sometimes Jordanian students are becoming themselves also victims of the idea that now they have Syrian refugees coming to their own schools. And then there's an attention to the Syrian refugees more than the Jordanian students in the host community. So how would you suggest dealing with such a different type of you know, victimizing, I would say, students and host communities throughout that proposal. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Um, we see the dynamic that you're talking about almost everywhere, is that the international community's approach to dealing with vulnerable populations is to treat them like a target audience, right? And yet, the community around that target audience are in sometimes as desperate a situation Um, they're not considered target audience by the standards of UNHCR or IOM or whoever else is providing aid. And so it actually creates tension between the 
target audience and the community. We saw this in Liberia when, because we're also in Cote d'Ivoire and working on the border areas of Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, when the Ivorians came over the border and the, the, the ethnic groups on both sides of the border are quite similar. There, there's a lot of family uh, and, and affinity uh, across the border. So when the refugees went over the border, Liberians generously took them in uh, to a large extent and they lived in the homes and were fed by the community in, in eastern Liberia. It's a great case study of, of local resilience. Um, but then the international community got involved and started favoring those people, but the people who had been feeding them for six months were getting nothing, yet they had you know, fed them from their plate. And so it's a messed up way of, of addressing it. And so the way that we strongly recommend dealing with that is actually to take a community-based approach, is to see the entire community, those that have received the refugees and those that are the refugees, as part of the, of the equation of what's needed and discussing and, and, and trying to work through solutions, rather than take a target audience approach. We saw this in, in Aceh after the tsunami as well. The tsunami hit on the, mount, on the hillside in certain parts of, of western Aceh uh, in Indonesia at a certain height. Homes below that line were quite destroyed, but right above the water line, there were homes that were uh, not as effective. All the money went to the zone right, next, right, right below the line, and it created huge conflict and tensions with those above the line. And so we have to be very c mindful of that. On your first question about what do you do at, the, at those four levels, I think the most important thing is to start at the individual level first and have the young person understand, understand some of these basic values and principles uh, in order to then be able to engage with their families. A lot of the dynamics that we see uh, in these countries are actually pretty dysfunctional family dynamics that are then manifested by the child. Uh, and so having the child be an engine of change back in the family is very powerful, very useful. Rather than going and trying to lecture parents, bring it to the dinner table, bring it back into the house through the young people is a powerful way to do it. But you have to equip the young person first. But how do you get, again, it, it's, it's not rocket science. How do you get them to be agents of trust in their, at the various levels? It's about learning how to listen, how to engage, how to problem solve together. Because as Wendy said, in peace building, a lot of what we do is about getting parties that have been fighting each other to actually co-construct a solution. I can go, if I'm an outsider, I can go and tell them a solution. Solution A is really great. But they're going to say, that's your solution, Scott. It's not ours. But if I help them come to the conclusion that solution A uh, or B is the, is the better solution, it's their solution. And that's going to be more effective. So building trust is really about there's a saying in Rwanda, in the language of Rwanda, Kenya Rwanda, which is that if we sweat together, we can live together. We have to work together towards solutions to start trusting each other. Trust comes along the way. You don't start with it. You have to earn it. It comes along the way of working together towards a common co-constructed solution. Wonderful. Th thanks for that. I, I'm slightly mindful of time. There are so many people I would love to take questions from, and I think maybe the solution is really uh, to, to come up at the end and I'll ask your uh, questions directly. But if we want to have a moment to, uh, to, ha to have our vote so that the uh, education ministers and yourselves can decide whether we should uh, adopt uh, Scott's policy to uh, introduce uh, peace building and various skills around values of building leaders uh, of tomorrow. So uh, by a show of hands now, would you like to uh, accept this proposition? Okay, the, the audience are overwhelming down here. Yes, so... There we go, your, your policy is voted in, the world will be a better place. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for attending. A round of applause, please, for the uh, education ministers and for the presenters today. Um, I'd just like to say, from my point of view, it's you know, fascinating to see what's been put forward, because so often uh, at these events, you know, we can talk about education and worry about getting another 2% on a PISA test of maths. But neither of these propositions are really about narrow academic learning. They're about actually making sure that young people benefit from and, uh, and in the, throughout their lives from what happens while well, in the time they're in education. So I hope these uh, types of policies do get adopted in your countries. And uh, you know, more, more props to the, the leaders who will uh, put these policies forward in the future. Thank you.